Do we know Him? How much of Him do we know? And do we want to know Him more? To know Him better? To know Him deeper? And in the end, fall in love with Him who first loved us. Welcome to Know Him Ministry. Join us live with our Bible study every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Here, we study the Bible and the three angels' message with the ultimate goal of knowing Him, His grace, His mercy, and His love. Happy evening to our viewers. Welcome to Know Him Ministry. Once again, I am Kai Bolivar, and I am delighted to learn with you to grow with you in this journey. For those of you who have just watched us live tonight, we are on our fifth lesson for our Bible study series, which will be viewed online in our official Facebook page and YouTube channel posted in our screens. So you may like our Facebook page, Know Him Ministry, and subscribe to our YouTube channel know him ministry as well for uh, for you to be updated or that you can view us live and join us live every friday evening at 7 30 p.m and of course with us here tonight is once again brother randy who will not only be leading us in opening our bibles but most importantly in understanding the words we read welcome once again brother randy I thank you, Sister Kai. A very pleasant evening to all our viewers. Tonight, we will be dealing with the subject, lesson number five, the 1,000 years of peace. Okay, for our viewers, especially those who have just viewed us live tonight, we want you to be a big part of this. So if you have your questions about our topic, or has a specific topic in mind that you want to study further, feel free to send us a message in our contact details posted in our screens. Or you may hit the DM button and message us. So before we will start our lesson five, uh, can you give us, can you join us for our opening prayer and can you lead us? Brother Randy, in our opening prayer, I would like to invite you to join us in our prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the opportunity to study your word. Tonight, as we dig into the subject of a thousand years of peace, we pray that your wisdom, the gift of your spirit, will be amongst us so that we will understand you more and know you more and we are able to comprehend and to understand the messages, especially the three angels' messages for us in these last days. Forgive us from all our sins. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so for our viewers, please be ready with your Bibles. Any version will do. And be re ready with your highlighters because we will be learning once again our Bible tonight. Now, Let's have a little bit of a review, Sister Kai, from our subject last week because it has a link. You see, there would be a galactic phenomena, a phenomenon that will appear in the clouds of heaven. This would be a universal sight that everyone will wonder and others will face it with gladness, others will face it with a bit, with a distressful event so tonight we will look at what happened before within and after these 1000 years okay so our topic is 1000 years of peace what does it mean for us let's go to our first question tonight how is the resurrection scene described in john 5 28 and 29 so we will be reading in the book of john 
5, 28, and 29. Shall I read it, Brother Randy? Yes, please, Sister Kai. Okay, it says in here, in the book of 28, in the verse of 28, I mean, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. 29, And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So now, you have to imagine this scenery. When Jesus will come with a trumpet sound, the John said, do, do not be amazed at this, for the time is coming. So those all who died in the grave will hear his voice, but they will not hear in voice all at once. Because in verse 29, some of them will come out to leave. They have to rise to leave. Those others will rise up condemned. So when would be the time that there would be a rising from the grave to leave? And when would be the time the rising of the dead that will be condemned. So we will look at this very distinctly that there would be a gap between the rising to those who will live for eternity and then those who will be rising that will be condemned forever. So there is a gap between the rising of these two groups that this verse is describing in John 5 28 so let me repeat do not be amazed at this that the time is come and the time is coming when all that means both groups all will hear his voice but then the first group will rise to life the second group will rise to death and there is a gap of time between the two. Okay, let's continue with our lesson for question number two. What is the advantage of being in the first resurrection? Now, that's a really good question. You see, the first resurrection, what is the advantage? Let's go and check it out in the Bible. Let's go in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, in verse 6. What is the advantage of a being in the first resurrection? Okay. Revelation 20 and verse 6. Okay, let us read Revelation 20 verse 6. I am reading from the New King James Version and your version might be different there, but it's all okay. Okay, Revelation 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, that is a good question. The advantage of a person being part of the first resurrection, so the first resurrection is considered rising to live. So that's why in the book of John, chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, so the first resurrection is the first rising will hear God's voice, Jesus' voice. They will hear Jesus' voice. They will come out of the grave and they are in the first resurrection. The advantage of being part of the first resurrection because the second death has no power over them. So those who are part those who have part in the first resurrection will become priests of God and then they will reign with Christ within a thousand years. Okay, let's continue with our study. Let's answer question number three. When Jesus returns, who will be punished? It's a good question. Who will be punished when Jesus comes? So let's go in the book of Thessalonians. So there were two books, the first and the second Thessalonians. But let's go to the second book of the Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 and 8. Okay, I read, And to give you 
who are troubled dressed with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Verse 8, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what will happen? Who will be punished when Jesus comes? So those who did not obey the gospel. The gospel means all of the Bible. All of the Bible. It's not a gospel of only New Testament because our very first subject, our very first study, you can go back to our first study, lesson number one, that it is the whole of the Bible, all scriptures. So the gospel of our Lord, those who reject the whole of the Bible and will not obey the gospel, the Bible is very clear. When Jesus comes, he will come with a fiery appearance and Jesus will consume them with the fire. will be punished by fire those who will not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's move to our fourth question for tonight. What happens to the wicked at the end of time? So something will be happened to them. Yep. So what happened? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 25 in verse 33. What happens to the wicked at the very end of time? Now, this is not talking about the end of a thousand years, but this is at the end of time, meaning just at the time of the coming of Jesus. What happened to the wicked at the end of time? Okay, let's read Jeremiah 25 verse 33. At the time those slain by the Lord will be everywhere from one end of the earth to the other. They will not be mourned or gathered up or buried, but will be like dung lying on the ground. So this verse, Jeremiah had seen it the future event that at that time at that time at the coming of jesus the the wicked will be slain by the fire will be punished because of their disobedience and then the description it says that the slain of the lord the dead is from everywhere from one end to the other they will not be mourned. Why are not they being mourned? Because no one to mourn them. You see, they are the, the wicked that will run to the caves, run to the mountains, because they cannot stand the Lamb sitting on the throne. And those who have part in the first resurrection, or those who are who have part in the first rising will live forever. They will be with God and with Christ. So no one will mourn them. No one will gather them. No one will bury them. They will be like a dung lying on the ground. Okay, let's now answer our fifth question. What is the condition of the earth at the Lord's coming? So now we ask about the wicked sister Kai. This is a good question, Sister Kai, because now we are getting into a, a, a minute detail of what really the Bible is teaching about the condition of the earth at Jesus' coming. So let's get back to Jeremiah chapter 25 in verse 33. What? Jeremiah chapter 5 in verse 33. Okay, and 34, maybe up to 34 as well. Okay, let's read Jeremiah chapter 5. Next slide, please, um, Pastor. What's that? Jeremiah chapter, chapter 25, verse 33. 33. So once again, I'll be reading in the New King James Version. Jeremiah 25, verse 33 to 34. <laughs> And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refused on the ground. Whale shepherds and cry roll about in the ashes. 
you leaders of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and your dispersions are fulfilled. You shall fall like a precious vessel. Okay. So, they will not be buried, they will be lying, and the earth would be like a desolate. Alright, so the condition of the earth at Jesus' coming would be a situation where the earth will go back to its original state. Let's go to the next question. Okay, let's describe the earth's desolation during the millennium as predicted by Jesus. So let's describe, let's have a look what is happening. So Luke chapter 17. So the earth will be a desolate place during that 1,000 years as Jesus predicted. Okay, Luke 17, 28 to 30. For our viewers, Luke is in the New Testament of the Bible. Luke 17, 28 to 30. It says, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30. Okay, in verse 30, it says, Even so will I, will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Thank you, Sister Kai. So, you have here a description in the past. So, this is history. This is history. Sodom and Gomorrah where Lot were and his family. The earth condition is condition the condition of the earth during the millennium is just like in the time of Lot. That when Jesus will come, he will come with fire. So in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was burnt with fire and sulfur. So the destruction of this planet Earth is a destruction by fire. It's no longer by flood or waters, but it's by fire as Jesus described during his ministry about the time of the Sodom and Gomorrah. So this day, Jesus said, when I come, it will be just like the day the Son of Man is revealed. There will be a fire and it will devour. So in Lot's time, Lot has to leave his place, Sodom and Gomorrah, together with his wife and daughters. Because God said, I will burn them with fire. So, Jesus said, so it will be just like on the day the Son of Man is revealed when Jesus is revealed the father will reveal Jesus and his coming and then it will be a burning of fire this planet earth but shall not be consumed only the wicked and all the elements therein okay let's now answer question number seven what happens to Satan during the millennium now let's have a look a little bit of this one what happened to Satan during the millennium? Revelation chapter 20 in verses 1, 2, and 3. So let's have a bit of a review. When Jesus comes, he will come with fire. The first resurrection, which are the righteous people, will be rise to death from dead, from death, from the grave. And they will be with God and with Christ to reign for a thousand years. They will be taken to heaven. The wicked will remain on this earth like a dung, will be a heap of fire of the dung here in this planet. And then now the question is what happens to Satan? Let's go. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1, 2, and 3. Okay, I'll read in verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand verse 2 he laid hold of the dragon that serpent of old 
who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. In verse 3, And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, this is interesting because Satan is the only living being in this planet during a thousand years. The wicked, he's got no one to deceive. He's got no one to tempt because all of the wicked are dead. They are not alive. The living saints are taken together, are caught up together in a cloud. Those who are alive when Jesus come and those who are dead at the sound of the trump, God will rise them out from the grave and then they will be together with the, le with the living taking caught up to heaven. So now only Satan, the abyss that this chapter or this verse is talking about is this planet earth. This earth is the bottomless pit. So I'll give you a clue. I would like you to reimagine how Joseph being thrown into the dry well when his brothers were eating on the top of the well, surrounding the well. It's just like that. Satan will be thrown into a bottomless pit and then the living will be with God and with Christ for a thousand years. And the Bible continues to describe in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 3, when the 1,000 years were ended, the Bible say, Satan will be set free for a short time. Okay, let's proceed with question 8. This time, let's answer this question. What opposition to God occurs at the end of the 1,000 years? All right. Revelation chapter 20 in verses 7, 8, and 9. What opposition to God occurs at the end of the 1,000 years? All right, let's read it. Revelation chapter 20, verses 7, 8, and 9. Okay, for our viewers, the book of Revelation is found at the very la the last book of the Bible. So let's read Revelation 20, verses 7 to 9. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Verse 8, and will go out to deceive the nations with, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Verse 9, the last verse, They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and a fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, after the expiration of a thousand years, Satan will be released from his prison. So, the bottomless pit, the bottomless pit, which is the abyss, which is this planet Earth, is like a prison to him because he is the only living being and Satan is no longer allowed to be going around anywhere because he will pay the price of the sin that he instigated in the human family. Now, once the 1,000 years will expire, God will resurrect the wicked. That is called the second resurrection. So when they will wake up, Satan again will begin to convince them that that holy city, that city that the beloved of God, they will surround this is a, the last opposition to God during, uh, after, sorry, 
and opposes to God after 1,000 years. They will surround the city. Once, once the city is surrounded, the Bible says, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. This is the ultimate price of the disobedience and those who love to follow the satanic movement. The fire will devour both Satan, his demons, and the people that disobey the gospel. This is what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 in verses 7, 8, 9. Okay, let's answer our ninth question for this study. When does sin come to a final end? So there will be an end to all of our sins. There would be an end. Praise God for that, Brother Randy. That is the good news. Because we cannot live in this life like this. This is not the plan that God designed for the human family. Remember, the human family is the extension of the heavenly family. Satan destroy this human family. So I'd like to invite you viewers, because before we open this verse, when the sin will come to its final end, that all the disaster that has happening now in this planet, all the famines, all these pestilences, all these earthquakes, all these bushfires, all of this are the workings of Satan. He, this is his modus operandi, so that each one of us will blame God. But this is not the workings of God. God will put an end to sin. Let's go in Revelation chapter 20 in verses 14 and 15. Revelation chapter 20 verses 14 and 15 when does sin come to its final end verse 14 it says then death and hades were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death verse 15 and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire my apology for that verse when at the end will come to its end so let's get back to our bible revelation chapter 20 verses 14 and 15 when it's come to its end all of the wicked all of satan's agencies and satan's demons all of them those who are outside the holy city the disobedience, the criminals, the people who rejected the gospel, the people that had made a decision not to listen to the good news of the Bible, the people that persecuted Jesus and put him to death, the people that had taken part in opposing the good news of salvation at the very end of a thousand years when all of God's people will be delivered and are in the holy city those outside the holy city the final end of sin and sinners will be in the lake of fire. This earth will be just like a lake. Nowhere Satan, the demons, and the disobedience to hide. There is no secret rapture. There would be no hiding place. There will be no other 
avenue to escape from this final consummation, this final judgment, this final penalty of sin. God will put an end to sin and it is by fire and Satan and his angels will be thrown into the lake of fire. So in Revelation chapter 20, there are cycles of events of a thousand years. Satan will be thrown. The beasts will be thrown. The false prophet will be thrown into that lake of fire, including those who rejected the gospel. God will prepare a lake of fire to finish and to make an end to sin. Okay, let's go to the second to the last question for our study. What does God create after sin is finished forever? Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 21. We'll read verse 1 and then we jump into verse 4. Okay, I read still in the New King James Version, Revelation 21 verse 1. Now I saw the new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. We'll go to the verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What a good promise. This is the best part of the story. You see, we begin in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, with a perfect condition that God has created. And then Satan destroyed that perfect creation. And then at the very end of the book of the Bible, at the very last two chapters of the Bible, God said that He will create a new heaven and a new earth. And in this heaven, in this new heaven, and in this new earth, Jesus promised that in this, there will be no more death. There will be no more pain. There will be no more crying. There will be no more suffering. Every tear from their eye, God will wipe them out. Friends, the promise of Jesus is as sweet as the years go by. Sweeter. Sweeter than honey. This promise of His coming and the penalty for sin and the creation of the new heaven and the new earth because the earth that we are in now, this old earth, this old heaven, Jesus said, will pass away. The old system of living will pass away. God will bring us back into the lost Eden. He will restore the Garden of Eden for us throughout eternity without the interference, without the appearance, and without the presence of Lucifer and his demons that instigate, that lead us into all this pain and suffering. What a good news. What a promise that Jesus has made to you and to me and to all of us. God is inviting us to join with him in the obedience of his gospel so that we can be part of that new heaven and the new earth. We praise God for that wonderful promise for us, Brother Randy. Let's go to our last question for tonight. Can you imagine feeling absolutely secure, safe inside the holy city with a perfectly happy eternity 
stretching ever before you? I cannot begin to imagine what it would be like inside that holy city. But at the same time, it is a mixed emotion because you are inside that holy city and you can see your loved ones outside that holy city swimming in the lake of fire. You are feel safe and secure. That's what the Bible has promised. That's why Jesus said, God will wipe away our tears, seeing our loved ones outside that holy city. Tonight, it would be an invitation for you not to be part, but to be part in that holy city. To be part, to be within, to get inside into that holy city. This is the purpose of our Bible study. The three angels' messages, these last warnings to this dying world, in this older world, in this old world that will soon come to its end. There is an invitation to be part of this new heaven and new earth. God is inviting us to be part of this new heaven and the new earth. Okay, for our reflective question, especially for our viewers tonight, Brother Randy, when God makes all things new, is it your desire to be safe inside the holy city? It is my desire. It is my desire to be inside that holy city no matter what happened to this life. Whatever experience or experiences that we've been through in this life here, either in joy or in pain, there is a better place. And that desire if you're only willing to open your heart for God to come in, God will put that desire inside your and mine heart to make that desire to be part and to be safe inside that holy city. Tonight, make it as your desire so that we can be inside that holy city. Yes, amen. It is my desire too and my prayer that we will all be there in that holy city which our Christ has prepared for all of us. Thank you, Brother Randy, and thank you for our viewers who joined us live tonight in our Bible study series. Yes, we are all learners at the feet of Christ. Thus, we invite you to join us live every Friday evening at 7.30 with our Bible study series. And to close our program tonight, Brother Randy, I would like to invite everyone to join us in our closing prayer. We praise you, O Lord God, for your guidance tonight. We thank you for guiding us and leading us in our Bible study. We thank you for giving His Word that we may know you more. And we are looking forward to be in that heavenly home, into that holy city, that you have prepared for each one of us. Continue to bless us, O Lord God, in our journey, and may this study tonight will be a blessing to every one of us. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Christ's loving name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for our viewers. See you again next week here in Know Him Ministry, where we study the Bible and the three angels' message with the ultimate call of knowing Him, His grace, His mercy, and His love.